But first, we're revisiting our journey through the history of agriculture in the British Isles now. Interviews and home movie footage tells the story of the milk revolution. Preserved in the flickering images of the films shot by some of Britain's farmers is a unique record of the influences that drove a 20th century revolution on the land. A revolution that left no area of farming unchanged. By 1978, Britain was self-sufficient in temperate foodstuffs. We hadn't been self-sufficient since the 1760s. That is an extraordinary achievement. Why did farming go from this to this? How did we go from milk delivered by the milkman to an industry dominated by supermarkets? And why today are there so few family farms left? When my grandfather came here 100 years ago, there were probably 26 dairies supplying milk into the Swindon market. And now we're the last one. Told through the home movies and voices of the farmers who both led the changes and who were at the sharp end of them, the programmes in this series tell the story of the revolution in the four pillars of Britain's food production. Wheat, horticulture, meat and milk. Milk is a huge industry. Britain's farmers produce around 13 billion litres of milk every year. Ever since we began to recognise that milk was good for our health, the daily pinter has been part of our diet and our culture. And milk is hugely important for Britain's farmers. Milk takes a larger share of farm profits than any other product. But the way it's produced and sold, and even the product itself, has changed dramatically. In the 1920s, there were 150,000 farmers producing milk. Most of it was sold door to door. Today, nearly all of the milk we drink is produced from specialist cows. It's treated in large-scale processing plants, and 90% of it is sold by supermarkets. And the number of dairy farmers has shrunk to 15,000. Come on, you old devil. Come, come on. Will Hosford is a dairy farmer in North Dorset. It's a semi tame cow, unfortunately. So it's a bit of a friend. Will grew up on the farm with his two brothers. This is him as a toddler. He's on the left. And here he is at four years old, herding cows in the same red pullover. Growing up on this farm, I, I think, was, was good fun, great fun, really. At quite a young age, we were always out doing something on the farm. Excuse me. Nick Gosling farms a herd of Guernsey dairy cows in North Wiltshire. Like Will, Nick grew up on the farm. This is him as a five-year-old. To go out with Dad was a thrill. I used to ride around with him everywhere. I was just his apprentice, really. This is his wife, Christine. They married in 1981. And as soon as we were married, I, I was taught to milk and looked after the calves. I fell in love with this farm. Will Hosford and Nick Gosling's home movies and family histories reveal the scale of the milk revolution and why, when most dairy farmers have given up, they are carrying on. Steady up now. Woo woo. How are you doing? How are you? How's that foot? How's that foot? I know. Well, we have about uh, 90 in the herd, but of course it goes up and down. There you go. We've got Guernseys, we've always had Guernseys, because um, we love the colour of the milk, and it's such a 
quality milk, it goes on to make the fantastic butter and cream. Well, the, the uh, sugars are the highest in the grass now for about the next hour. And then as soon as the sun starts to go down, the sugars disappear and um, there's not so much goodness in the grass. So we let them out for a quick bite now and then before it gets too cold tonight, because they're talking about the frost, we'll get, have them back in. They'll be back on their straw. I'm in charge of the arable side of the farm and the producing of the food for the cows. And I'm working round the herd and then the centre core of the herd, the actual milking, is performed by Chris, my wife. I married Nick, which was 25 years ago. I start at 5 o'clock in the morning and then again at half past three in the afternoon. And it's a very physical, very physical job. These scenes of life at Barclay Farm were filled by Nick Gosling's mother. She bought her first camera just after the war and then carried on filming for almost 40 years. Once she got her, her cine film, she got the bug and we could do nothing without a cine film being stuck in our face. Mum, who never went near the farm except to get us picnics and bring out stuff out to the combine, but she always liked to be on film on the farm. <laughs> so that was our very first combine, with Dad and Uncle Toby driving. But it was so exciting, when the combine got going, everyone used to rush out to watch the combine. The Gosling story begins at the start of the last century. Grandfather moved to Artist Farm, which is the next one down, which was a rented farm, and he came there in 1908. And uh, he was just a small 60, 70 acre farm with a few cows, and he gradually built up the herd and um, then decided in about 1919 he'd, he'd start delivering milk locally to the village. And Nick's grandfather wasn't alone. A sensible farmer would give up growing wheat, particularly mixed farming on bad wheatlands, and move into dairying. The reason is quite simple. There is a growing and continually growing demand for dairy product, fresh milk, butter, cheese, but also industry and commercial use of dairying. Most of these farmers sold their milk to a milk processor. By the late 1920s, these processors were able to use their economic power to drive down the price of milk they paid to farmers, and many farmers struggled to survive. But in 1934, the government stepped in. It created an organisation that bought all the milk produced by farmers and then sold it on their behalf to the processors. It was called the Milk Marketing Board and it gave economic power to the dairy farmer. As a result of the guaranteed price, I don't think there's much doubt that more people went into dairying. Many people excited by the new opportunities that were opening up in agriculture in the 1930s was David Hosford. When we were little boys, my father was very keen on the countryside and all the rest of it. And when it came to leave school, what was I going to do? Well, I was going farming. I think I'm going to need a hand to push this over, Pavel. It's his son, Will, who now runs the family farm. <laughs> no use trying to do the filming and the work at the same time because you lose the camera and the straw but he does record what's going on on the farm. He likes to keep a record. And it's quite interesting to look at the pictures 
from years gone by. Well, I was brought up in London, in Highgate, where my father was a GP, but the countryside was always very important. He, he was keen on the countryside, he was a bit of a naturalist, and when we purchased this cottage uh, in uh, Whipsnade, country life became part of our life. That's David in 1938, driving the cart with his younger brother and sister. We got to know this farm, Church Farm Whipsnade, and the family, Bates, the farmers, very well. And extraordinarily enough, they used to welcome us. We were visitors that they liked to see. We weren't muddling urbanites. And I can remember I said to my father, go and ask him if there's something we can do. And I was about nine or ten then. I would be given something or other to do, and I suppose because I showed some keenness, Gradually, we were allowed to lead the horses, and, uh, and I suppose we really, the family, got really keen on farming. And this is the three of them on the farm wearing air raid helmets, two years after the outbreak of World War II. Through the war, we spent... We weren't evacuated to the cottage in the war. We lived in London, but... Um, we spent quite a lot of time at the cottage. It was only within an hour's run from home. And we really got dug in at that farm. The war had a profound impact on most areas of agricultural output, but not milk production. The Second World War ought to have damaged the fortunes of dairy farmers in some ways. The concentration on the production of the staple, i.e. wheat, did certainly take a good deal of pasture out of production and certainly the number of cattle fell during the war. They didn't fall as much as they might have done for the simple reason that in the 1930s particularly people had become aware of the science of diet and in that milk acquired a particular place as essential for kids in particular. And it's during the war that you get the introduction of school milk. Now, the purpose of school milk is to ensure that children get a certain amount of calcium in their diet and so on. So that actually kind of protects dairying to an extent during the war. War ended in 1945, but Britain continued to face food shortages and rationing. And a balance of payments crisis meant the country didn't have the money to import food. So, to encourage domestic production, the government took a fundamental decision. It decided to continue to pay financial subsidies to farmers. The approach was enshrined in the 1947 Agriculture Act. The Agriculture Act of 1947 is without doubt, the most important piece of agricultural re legislation passed in the 20th century. Absolutely no doubt at all. At some very basic level, it saved British farming. Under the Act, dairy farmers were to be given a guaranteed price for all the milk they could produce. It amounted to an open invitation to increase output, and it led to a revolution in every aspect of dairy production. It was already happening when David Hosford moved on to his farm in Dorset in 1952. What, since the 50s? Yeah, well, the first film I remember is a calf in front of my father's house, old dad's house. Yeah. And that must have been within about six months of her taking over the farm in 1952. I'm not uh, sure I can remember that. No, no, you were just a twinkle in my eye in those days. <laughs> yes. age 55, my father said, I'm going to retire and we will look for a farm, which was very exciting. We bought the farm and we moved in, and that was in September 1952. And we've been here ever since. The 
The Hosfords had bought a classic mixed farm. They had a little of everything. Well, we took over lock, stock and barrel, which means we took all the machinery and all the livestock. And the livestock consisted of four nurse cows. We had two sows and about 200 hens. Fairly soon, we pushed along into dairying, although probably for 10 years we grew some grain. The cows became more important and you couldn't have both. There wasn't room for both. We hadn't got the acreage. We didn't set the trend. <laughs> the trend was to specialise. As the system of price guarantees was introduced following the 47 Act, David realised that if they were going to maximise their output and profits, they would need to become specialist producers. In Wiltshire, the Gosling's mixed farm was moving in the same direction. Chris went to work when we first got married for a neighbouring farmer to help him do his lambing. and came back with lambs that grew into sheep and then had lambs, and they were forever getting out. And those animals were more of a nuisance than a hundred cows. It drove me mad. We really had to specialise more. And there wasn't the profit in all those enterprises unless you were very efficient. So to specialise, you had to then put all your energies into, into one type of farming. Chickens on the scale we had them weren't cost effective and the pigs the same. Because uh, the economies of scale uh, were driving the system, it was becoming more and more important for small farms to specialise on one in one activity rather than a variety of activities. A few hens, a few pigs, a few cows didn't make commercial sense. But it was also part of the, the guarantees that government was giving. Historically, one of the reasons for mixed farming is because you've got various eggs in various baskets. But if everything was guaranteed, you didn't need that same diversification of risk to the same extent as you did before. But the revolution in dairy farming went well beyond specialisation. Farmers were beginning to realise that because there was a guaranteed market for all they could produce, they had a huge financial incentive to increase their output. In agriculture, you can only increase production in two ways, extensively or intensively. Extensively means bringing more land, in inverted commas, into cultivation. Well, in dairying, this means simply having more cows. The problem is that the land which you can keep cows on is not infinite. So therefore, the most sensible way to increase production and the way which is dominant in the post-war era in Britain is by intensively farming what you've got. In other words, in the case of cows, increasing the yield per animal of milk. <laughs> And MMB Regional Livestock Royal Show Judge. Dairy farmers set about intensifying production in broadly three ways. They embraced genetics to develop new breeds of cow, science to alter its diet, and technology to make milking more efficient. In the milk by infrared analysis. This is the Herringbone Milking Parlour at Will Hosford's Dorset Dairy Farm. A herdsman and an assistant milk the herd of 300 cows twice a day, every day of the year. During the 1930s, as David Hosford remembers, it was very different. To start off with, you were doing it by hand, and then you had a portable milking machine which you took from cow to cow. Well, just imagine 150 cows there and 150 down here. You'd walk a very long way. In 1952, we bought a bale, and a bale is a mobile contraption which you drag across the fields. We were pretty green. We, I hadn't had much experience of. I knew about horses, which perhaps didn't serve us very well, but I didn't know much about dairying. However, we got the cows to go through the milking bale. Then, in 1963, he was the first farmer in the area to install a herringbone milking parlour. 
He'd seen them in action on a study tour of Australia and New Zealand. I remember in Australia driving with a journalist in a very tatty train in Victoria, the state of Victoria, going north to the irrigation areas. And we were going there, he was going as a journalist, and we were travelling together. And I said, well, he said, what do you want to see? Dive. And I said, I really want to see how one man can look after a hundred cows. Oh, God, we'll see plenty of that. And it was remarkable. When we got to this irrigation area, there were lots and lots of herds being ran, run very efficiently by the farmer with really little input, labour input from anything else. The Herringbone mil Milking Parlour was a big step forward in cutting down the labour and milking cows efficiently. By the 1980s, David Hosford's once revolutionary milking parlour had been adopted by most dairy farmers. Today, that technology is itself being replaced by systems that can milk 70 cows without any labour. Once these cows have been trained, they can be milked by computer-automated machines and rarely see a herdsman. But it was not just the way cows were milked. It was the way they were fed that changed radically after the war. Up until the 1930s, nearly all the food for cows came off the farm. They fed in the fields in the summer, and farmers dried grass and made hay for the winter. It was a labour-intensive, arduous and weather-dependent summer activity on most farms in Britain. By the 1970s, haymaking and these images had vanished, replaced by a new feed called silage. It's mid-June at Barclay Farm in Wiltshire, and Nick Gosling is making silage. Silage is grass that is cut early, while it still has moisture, and then compressed. Farmers found it to be much more nutritious for cattle feed than hay. Well, it should be dry matter about 35%, and this is dry matter about... 15 or 14 percent, so it's twice as wet as it needs to be. The idea was it was cut last Sunday and it was going to be picked up on Monday, and it rains Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're now in Friday, and we've decided we can't wait any longer, and it's rained again today. But it, we've picked it up, and if you see in there, you should find little bits of wheat. There they are. There's a bit of wheat. There's a bit there. That's what we're after. And that's what makes, that's the starch portion of the food. The transition from hay was a gradual one. It took time before farmers developed the skills to make good silage. The additive we're putting on the silage here we now put a microbial additive on to make the silage work better. This is an acid one, and this acid was sulfuric acid. And it used to rot the metal on the machinery, and it would rot our clothes. We'd completely come back after silage making with holes in our clothes. And if you uh, didn't watch it, it went in your face and in your eyes. You, you knew you were in agony. David Hosford filmed the same changes on his Dorset farm. The next stage on was make the silage at the buildings when you had great big trailers, which now are huge, you see them on the road, full of stuff. I remember getting the local trailer maker in Dare Weston to make these trailers, which were 12 by 8, I think, in size. Oh, David, you don't want trailers that size. Oh, you'll come adrift. Now, of course, they're tiny little trains. We'll make them, he said, Adams and uh, Weston. We'll make them if you want us to, but... 
farmers who fed their dairy cattle silage instead of hay were able to increase yields from around 15 to 25 litres of milk a day per cow. But another development was to double yields again. And this involved the use of genetics to modify the breed of the cow itself. Before the war, the dominant dairy breeds had been Ayrshire and Shorthorn. But the post-war policy that encouraged farmers to intensify output changed all that. Every farmer feels that he's going to benefit if he has a cow that produces more milk. It's very easy to sell the farmers the idea that the cow that produces the most milk will make the most money. In the periods of the 50s and 60s and 70s, that was really the Frisian, black and white Frisian cow, who was a very good cow for English conditions. However, meanwhile, in North America, Canada and the USA, they were breeding what is now known as the North American Holstein. The North American Holstein cow was a barn-fed cow, not turned out to grass, mostly zero graze, kept in a barn the whole year round, fed on very, very high energy maize and alfalfa diets, and she was designed to produce more and more and more milk per cow. The breed as a whole is the result of careful selection for both conformation and yield. He is looking for an animal Increased productivity was the goal, the and the Ministry of Agriculture and the Milk Marketing Board produced films to encourage it. This yearling is now ready to be admitted to the progeny test programme. From Chippenham, the young bulls are moved to an AI freezing unit. The collected semen is immediately processed in the laboratory. Sufficient semen is collected from each bull on test to get 330 cows in calf in officially milk recorded herds. The breeders were able to um, persuade the British farmer to go away from the classic British Frisian into the North American Holstein. I mean, we're talking now of cows that can produce 60 litres a day. If you can imagine uh, 110 milk bottles outside your door in the morning, that's the sort of amount you can get out of a single cow. By the late 1970s, most British dairy farmers were adopting the American Holstein, and yields had soared. Bloody cold this morning. It is bloody cold. Are you going to come up and film us bedding up? Yes, I've got to keep filming. You've got to keep the thing going. Will Hosford made the transition to Holsteins soon after he took over the farm from his father in the early 1980s. Well, how are these animals doing? They look a bit skinny. I suppose they're all right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you always say. You well, always say they're not great. Right. Well, it's always quite difficult when you go from one generation to another. Many farmers, it doesn't go really smoothly. But I remember well the time it happened to me. I was driving the forage harvester, as I always do, and bloody little William came along and he said, I think I'd better take over this. I thought I'd been doing it quite well. And from that day onwards, he had taken over the farm. Very amiably, and the transition went very smoothly, but I reckon that was the day when things changed. <laughs> I'm sure he was only too happy that I drove the forage harvester. <laughs> he suffered from hay fever terribly, and I'm sure he was only too happy to hand over this noisy machine to some young person who's only too happy to drive it up and down the field. <laughs> I decided then that I needed to increase the financial turnover of the farm. I changed the breeding of the cows, and I produced a more Holstein-type cow, which is a bigger cow, which will produce more milk. Come on. Come on. Ah. My father was probably producing around four to four and a half thousand litres of cow, and we eventually got to around eight to eight one, eight thousand one hundred litres per cow. The cows changed radically, I would say. They became much more angular and larger. Come on, Gary. No, oh, come on. Go on. No, <laughs> you old bugger. Come on. Come on. The move to intensively farmed Holstein cows that Will Hosford and many other dairy farmers made came at a price. The years of expansion saw an increase in the production diseases suffered by dairy cows. Mastitis, infertility and lameness. 
problems that persist today. Any suggestions on how to move a ton and a half a ball? Come on. Call Gary. <laughs> Come on. Come on. An image of cows with a bull and the bull lame has a certain no? irony about it because generally bulls don't get lame, partly because they don't, they're not under the same pressure as cows and partly because farmers are more likely to look after them. In dairy cows, 80% of the lameness is in the hind legs and 80% and of that is in the outer claw of the hind feet. And that, in part, reflects the fact that, that they've been selecting for cows with bigger and bigger udders. And if you can imagine two feet going straight down, you stick something like a, a medicine ball in between them. It throws the knees out, it throws the ankles in, throws the weight onto the outside foot, increases the pressure on the outside foot, and that's the one that gets... the sole gets torn off. Right, 407 I've seen hanging about here. 407, 397. 397. I wonder if we've all got 397 already. Well, is that they have a tendency to be have more problems with lameness, yes. They're, I think their hooves are thinner and their uh, legs in particular perhaps are not as good for particularly if you're somebody like me who wants them to walk quite a long way to pasture every day. That can cause trouble, yes. And we did have an increase in incidence in lameness. Definitely. Well, as far as the cow is concerned, the main impact of lameness is it hurts. As far as the farm is concerned, it's another reason for a cow breaking down. The lame cow will eat less, she will lose body condition, she will give less milk, she'll probably become infertile, and then she will have to be culled from physical exhaustion after maybe two or three lactations. From the time David Hosford bought his first dairy cows in 1952, to the time his son took control of the farm in the early 1980s, dairy farmers had prospered. Farming was easier. Subsidies, advisors, everything. And the prices were guaranteed all the time. If you remember, we used to have a price review every year when the prices for most things were set. Nowadays, you could, can't really believe that. Encouraged by advisors from the Milk Marketing Board and the Ministry of Agriculture, they'd used science to change cattle feeds, they'd adopted new technologies for milking, and they'd embraced genetics to change the breed of the dairy cow itself. The result had been that milk yields had increased fourfold in just two generations. And while farmers were being urged to produce more and more, the public was being urged to drink more and more. In 1957, the slogan, Drink a Pinter Milker Day, was created and in a few years became one of the best-known advertising slogans of the century. The word pinter achieved dictionary recognition and today the public knows well the difference between a pinter and a pint. Politicians, too, made use of it. Buy it, drink it, that's my advice. It's nice, it's good for you, drink a pinter milker day. Drink a pint of milk a day. But the public didn't respond. By the 1960s, consumption had levelled off. By the 1970s, I think people are beginning to worry about the production of milk, or rather the massive overproduction of milk. Um, and it's not just a British problem, it's a European-wide problem. And once British farming goes fully into the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, in 1978, it becomes clear, I think on a European level, that we are massively overproducing milk. Latest figures confirm Britain, like Europe, has a food mountain out of control. Despite Ethiopia, despite Bob Geldof, its value increased by 75% last year. By the early 80s, the popular press on bad news days is picking up on things like butter mountains and milk lakes. And this is really very, very bad publicity for farming. But it's also beginning to put pressure on the EC. From the 80s, it's clear the CAP is going to have to be reformed 
and dairying is the first bit that's picked off. May increase fivefold by 1990. Something had to change. Either the milk prices had to fall sharply, or another way of cutting production had to be found. And at that time, there were calculations made which said that in order to get rid of the surpluses, the milk price would have to fall by 25%. And that was politically unacceptable within the European community, where, of course, farmers had a huge say, particularly in the 1980s, because much of the European policy was the common agricultural policy. That was the centrepiece of the European project in many ways at that time. So the alternative was to impose quotas and force production to drop. Under the quota system, individual farmers had to restrict their output to 1981 levels. Milk quotas came in in 1984 a little bit out of the blue. It, we've been told they were coming, but they did come out of the blue, and they did shake us all up to the extent that we had no idea really, as far as, far as I remember, how much milk we were going to be allowed to sell. And worse than that, if the milk lorry took away milk that was above quota, we were going to be charged a fine. We were not going to get the price of the milk, but we were also going to get beaten to supply some money for the privilege of them taking it away. And I remember we were so ill-informed about it, perhaps because we were a bit dim, but I think in general farmers didn't know what was going to happen, that we loaded milk into 40-gallon drums and took it away to feed our calves on, and we forced the milk down the calves as we thought it would be better to do that than it would put it down the drain. But in the end, the thing did become rationalised, and I think even in the first year of quotas, we managed to keep within our quota but it did kibosh any expansion. And that was in strict contrast to all the rest of my farming career. You could always sell at a predetermined price any amount of milk that you produced. 1984 was a defining year for the dairy industry. Milk quotas marked the beginning of the end of the system of guarantees that farmers like David Hosford had experienced all their working lives. But even then, another significant change was on the way. Most milkmen were small traders who'd only one cart or pram and served just a few streets. But they usually made their rounds three times a day, starting before six in the morning and each time with fresh milk. The other great change that took place in the 20th century was how milk was sold. Fairly early on, in the 20th century, big combines bought and sold milk, particularly in the big cities. But there was still a very large number of small and localised suppliers, sometimes producer retailers, sometimes simply retailers who bought from local dairies or whatever. But one thing that held them together was this curious British thing of delivering milk to the doorstep. Now. I don't think that happens anywhere else in the world. At Barclay Farm in Wiltshire, Chris Gosling is just finishing milking. And Nick, her husband, is taking it along the road to their dairy. From the 1920s, when Nick's grandfather began to sell his milk in Swindon, the Goslings bottled their own milk and throughout the post-war years they sold it door to door. This is Nick's father loading up churns in the late 1950s. Farming goes in dips and troughs, highs and lows, and whenever there was a trough, the milk rounds pulled us through. his dad and one of the roundsmen out trying to catch the horses early in the morning, probably about six o'clock, to go on a milk round. And these horses sometimes didn't want to be caught. And I also remember seeing dad running behind these horses trying to catch them. And he'd get his cap and throw it on the ground and s*** on it. 
and how's the little boy up in the bedroom watching this? The horses knew the round themselves, so they'd go off in the morning, and on one Christmas Eve, Taffy went off with strawberry. He drank too much whiskey, Taffy did, at his first few calls. He was then found at the end of his round. The horse had walked the whole round without him getting off the cart, and he was asleep in the back of the cart. And they got back to the farm with all the milk still on board. So Dad then said, well, you have to go back out again, and the horse refused to go because it had done the round that day. So why would it want to go again? But huge changes in the way milk was sold were looming. The doorstep delivery was being eclipsed by the emergence of supermarkets. Up to the late 1970s, the distribution of milk was controlled by the large processing and delivery companies, and they were able to fix the price. It would appear there was a cartel operating in the dairy industry, and uh, if the supermarkets wanted to buy milk, they could do so at the same price that the retail customer on the round was buying milk, and it would come in a glass bottle, and it would be delivered to the front door of the supermarket uh, from the retail round, and that just wasn't feasible as far as the supermarkets were concerned. The first supermarket to break this system was Sainsbury's. In June 1980, it began to sell milk half a penny cheaper than the doorstep price. It was a fundamental change, and in time it broke the economic power of the processors. I think that was a major turning point because, uh, I mean, in, in some ways, sadly, because the retail round had performed a number of different functions for society as a whole, but it was the beginning of the end of the, of the retail round. We actually not... In affected by it too much at the beginning of the 80s even because we only had the one store here in Roughton. We were supplying them with the milk at the time so it didn't matter too much to us if they sold some of our milk through their store. But they were taken over and Summerfields came in and then the multi out of town stores started up and suddenly we realised yes our doorstep trade was going. There has been a remarkable transformation. In the, in the 1980s, the doorstep delivery for a milk were as much as 80% of total liquid milk consumption. Currently, that's down to about 12%, with the supermarkets taking most of the rest. The influence of the supermarkets was profound. Not only did they revolutionise the way milk was sold, they drove changes in the nature of the product itself. Nick's milk arrives at their processing plant. The goslings process and bottle it themselves. It comes from their herd of Guernsey cows, a tradition Nick inherited from his father. He believed in those early days that the best milk was still Channel Island milk and our customers deserved the best milk, so therefore they got the best cows, which were Guernsey's. When the milk arrives at the plant, it's raw and before the public can buy it, it has to be pasteurised. So this is the pasteurising unit, which is basically a large heat exchanger. It raises the temperature of the milk from 5 degrees centigrade up to 72 degrees and holds it at that temperature for 15 seconds, which uh, is the pasteurisation technique. As soon as it's done the pasteurisation, it, it then cools it back down again to 5 degrees uh, for keeping quality, so it'll keep longer. It's very important to get the temperature down as quick as we can. From 1945, most milk in Britain was being pasteurised. But as supermarkets began to sell it, they wanted the product to have a particular consistency and look, and therefore required it to pass through a second process called homogenisation. With the homogenisation, the process is you, you basically force the milk through a very small hole, which breaks all the fat globules down to a, a, a very small size, 
which gives a, a uniform, dispersed uniformly through the product and, and you don't get a cream line. And I think a long time ago the, the industry decided it's better if it's more uniform product. Uh, and, and that's why the, the, the larger dairies have gone with that. And so from the 1980s, most milk sold in Britain was homogenised. But not the milk sold by the goslings. With ours, it's the old-fashioned way, no homogenising, and you end up with that cream line on the top, which the customers seem to love. Uh, a lot of them tell us about uh, the joy of opening it up and pouring the, the cream off the top. And uh, yeah, we're one of the few still, still doing that. By the 1990s, the supermarkets had begun to change the face of the dairy industry. But the milk marketing board continued to protect the price that farmers received for their milk. Then, in 1994, there was a fundamental change. As part of a wider policy of using free markets and competition, the government abolished the board. Economic power slipped back to the retailers. While the MMB was there, the price was by and large protected. Once you remove that price protection, then the supermarket's power grows very rapidly. And I suspect what you're getting is, as in other respects, a return to the 1920s, where you have potential cartelization. In other words, one or two or three big buyers of milk, in this case the supermarkets, who can eventually dictate the price to the producer. The whole thing went completely wrong and it all became a turmoil, much as it had been in the 1934 before the Milk Marketing Board took up. And the dairy farmer had no power in the markets at all. It was all in the hands of these roguish buyers, these processors, aided and abetted by the supermarkets. And we were ground down and ground down until dairy farming was unprofitable. Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to make a start. We're running a little bit late, but we've had a very busy morning this morning. It's too loud, um, Charlotte. Can you turn it down a bit? The end of the milk marketing board was another defining moment in dairying. And for years after, it presented a huge crisis for many of its farmers. We're here today on behalf of uh, Jeff and uh, Helena. Um, uh, Thousands just gave up and sold their herds. We have a total of 207, and I think it's, uh, it's a real dispersal sale, ladies and gentlemen, right from the uh, oldest cow through to the baby cows, through to the Hereford bull. Have you left anything behind? A few Belgian blues. He's got some nice Belgian blues down there. I saw them last week. But otherwise in 1994, there were more than 35,000 dairy farmers. By 2000, the number had almost halved. The scale of decline was unlike anything the industry had ever witnessed. That's 720, 40, 740, 740, 60, 760, 80 on top. 80, 780, 800. At 780, 780, 780. On the hammer, then it's 780 guineas, and I sell it 780. By 2000, the price farmers were paid for a litre of their milk had fallen from 25 to 17p, below the cost of production. Nick and Chris Gosling's Wiltshire farm faced bankruptcy. Hello, then. Hello. How are you? Hello. Hello. Well, it Hello got to you. the point where the profits were all falling off, farm and milk crowns. All right, nuisance. The only way we could stay in farming was to become organic and, and, and go up market and form our own niche. Well, I've always pestered Nick ever since we got married that we should be organic. But um, it, was, it was his decision, as a commercial decision, to, to go ahead. As the time has gone on, even Nick, who can be quite cynical about these things, he calls homeopathy Harry Potter medicine. 
Um, he has actually decided that organic farming is the right way to go, and he does prefer it in the way that we treat the animals, the way that we treat the land. So um, it, I think we're both really glad that we did become organic. This is my friend Veronica. We converted the farm to organic, the cows became organic, the milk became organic. Now all we needed was to now see if we could sell our own organic milk. There were buyers of organic milk, but unfortunately the market was only growing at 5% a year, but production suddenly jumped to 15, 20, 30% a year. So suddenly there was too much milk, and the organic milk price then slumped. Well, we actually had the, the herd up for sale and uh, we were going to probably have to close the processing plant down and rent the buildings out. And my wife and I sat up in bed one morning and realised that we were only a month away from selling. The brochure was here, ready to go out to the public to buy and uh, we suddenly thought, gosh, we don't know what else we can do other than dairy farming. So I said, well, I'll give it one last chance and try and find someone who wants our milk. And luckily, we got hold of this company called Abel and & Cole, and now we're up and running with Abel & Cole. Abel & Cole is an organic food delivery service. As well as buying the goslings' milk, it buys their farmhouse cream and handmade butter. Keith Abel is visiting Nick. He wants to discuss plans for the future of their partnership. Here you are. That's the plan. That's the present milking yep. parlour. Yep. We're extending that building right down here. Right. Dry cows, springers, and then they, as they carve, they go into these pens. As yep. they go into the pens, they then enter the new parlour. Right. New silage clamp there. Right. And then the old silage clamp, which is up here, then becomes an extra building for the cattle. So it's all to do with cow comfort. We've designed moment, it for the cows. At the moment, the dry cows are over here somewhere. Oh, well, it's spread over all these yeah, buildings. Yeah, yeah. And you have yeah. to take... So and, it, and when this is cold and, the, and frosted, you have to take them across concrete. Yeah. And they fall over and this yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to keep it all in one building. Great. With all everything moving... 80% of my production yeah. is now going to Abel and Cole, which is too much, in a way, to have in one down. customer. Right. But um, as long as they keep growing and they keep wanting our product and we keep supplying what they want... Um, it's, it's a marvellous relationship we have with them and, and we're all very happy. While the relationship with Abel and Cole secured Nick Gosling's business, thousands of dairy farmers left the industry and milk production began to fall. This decline in production forced large retailers to rethink their strategy and for some farmers, the fear of a shortage of milk created an opportunity. Will Hosford took advantage and made a deal with the country's largest seller of milk. Woman, a little over 18 months ago, Tesco decided yeah, move, to have a dedicated producer group and I, as a milk producer in the South, was invited to become a Tesco producer, which I then became. Tesco, along with other supermarkets, began to obtain their supplies of milk through direct contracts with a limited number of farmers. Will is one of around 900 producers who supply the supermarket with a billion litres of milk a year. Ten years ago, they didn't have to have any involvement with farmers at all. They could go to a big processor and say, I need so many litres of milk on uh, tomorrow, please deliver it, uh, thank you very much, and this is what you'll get paid for it. Through the WI campaign, the NFU campaign, at a period of time when dairy farmers in particular were being paid rock-bottom prices, there was a, an impression that maybe the milk supply wouldn't be there in the future. And not only that, but provenance, i.e. The, where the milk, all the milk came from, how the animals were kept and how the farms were farmed became much more important in the public's eye, and therefore 
the supermarkets in particular, decided to go for a dedicated producer group where they knew exactly where their milk was coming from. Emma Rutter coordinates the scheme. And I was hoping, you know, that maybe with Liverpool University and all the rest, that maybe we'd be able to get perhaps some work done on specific issues within lameness that might help us all understand a bit more about it. Yeah, we sort of, as you know, the first year of the project, we were looking very much on lameness issues because that was one of the key issues that affected farmers. Yeah. And also consumers tend to notice the lame cows that are at the end of the herd coming in last because they've been waiting for the cows to cross the road. So it was both a consumer issue and a producer issue. So we looked at lameness first. But now we've bought the We have very much been blamed for what's happened in the past and I know coming into it from a farming background and actually being two years at Tesco's I do realise the sort of rather long memories what's happened before uh, and people can't get over that. Um, but we are out there to change and to actually say we're not basing it on what's happening in the marketplace anymore. We do realise we were part of that before but actually now we're going to guarantee you your cost of production and your milk price will never fall below that. I'll head for the gate. With the security of the Tesco deal in place, Will Hosford began to return to a less intensive way of farming. I decided to go for a, a lower output system, more pasture based and uh, produce so not substantially, but a little less milk. All round, it'll be easier for me and easier for the animals that I farm. He's gradually replacing the high-yielding Holsteins with lower-yielding Frisians. It's all part of his solution to the pressures he's faced in the last ten years. For Will and his father David, this has been the story of their entire farming lives, constant change. The people dairy farming just three generations ago might have found it hard to imagine just how much their working lives would have changed over the century. They milked by hand and delivered to the door. Their cows produced 15 litres of milk a day. Today's cows produce 60. Supermarkets, new breeds and even milking parlours were unheard of. Until the 1980s, they prospered. But from that time, they'd been witnesses to a revolution that saw thousands leave the land. And those who stayed do so in a state of perpetual uncertainty. But even in a world of constant change, there are some things that stay pretty much as they always were. We're there. Once it starts licking, Job done, one live car. And Mud, Sweat and Tractors continues here on BBC4 next Wednesday at the same time. Next this evening, we're taking time to remember those magnificent men and their flying machines. in stone the golden ages of British sculpture continues tonight at nine on BBC four don't do great things here Sarah Father, what's happened? 
I thought the streams have been trampled into the mud, sir. Leave me alone! We desperately need a new girls' high school built for the purpose. <laughs> Don't forgive me. He's the past, and you're the future. If you'll take my advice, you'll tread a little more carefully in future. I thought you were on my side. I am on your side. It's over. South Riding, the series continues. Sunday at 9 on BBC One. Catch up on BBC iPlayer. Before television stole the limelight, every British town had its own variety theatre. I think it's the best kind of show business, the most wonderful kind of show business. If you became a very big star, you could actually mix with kings and princes. This is the story of those who succeeded. I owe everything to variety. And the many who didn't. There was more magic on TV. Oh, yes, yes. I think there was so much more excitement. A tribute to a lost world. The story of variety with Michael Grade starts Monday at 9 on BBC Four.